algae. Isn't that this green stuff which I usually find in my shower when I haven't cleaned it for a while? Well, uh, that's at least what I thought when I heard about the plant for the first time. It's some green, probably slimy substance that you usually don't want to get in touch with, right? So how did I come to work with such a seemingly unappealing and unwanted plant? I found this picture in a German newspaper two years ago. The article was titled Wild West, and it showed committed locals who took the initiative of cleaning up their own lake from an algae plague. I mean, Wild West, it reminds me of cowboy movies. The Berliners with pitchforks being the heroes and, yeah, well, algae being the enemy. But I wondered, I mean, what do they do with those huge piles of algae after cleaning up? I mean, do they throw it away or do they use it as natural fertilizers? Generally, we know that our summers are getting warmer and warmer. Maybe not today, here in Hamburg it's super cold, but global warming is happening and lots of plants are suffering from that. Funny enough, there seems to be one species that actually profits from those new harsh conditions, and that's algae. I mean, they like higher temperatures and even a higher level of CO2. And they grow everywhere, not only here in Germany or in Europe. They're a global plant, and they adapt to different climates, to fresh water, salt water. They grow in the desert just as well as in the Arctic Sea. So, Generally, we regard algae as weeds, Unkraut in German, right? But I wondered, could we see them differently, maybe? Maybe even regard them as a resource? And this question made my colleague, as Johanna Glomp and me, start a journey of research and discovery for the past two years. As he's a textile designer and I'm a product designer, and together we took a look at this unwanted plant through the eyes of designers. And in the course of our research, we stumbled across this picture. This is China. And in 2013, China was facing a severe algae plague, like algae overgrowing the entire coast of Qingdao, really covering the entire beach in a thick green layer of algae. I mean, what would you say if you saw a beach like that? I just heard Ricky saying that he doesn't want to swim in it, and I would agree. But honestly, what is funny, the Chinese didn't seem to care at all. <laughs> they went swimming in the middle of an algae plague. They were covering their entire bodies in the green texture. I mean, that makes you think, if the perception of this plant is so fundamentally different in other parts of the world, maybe our view on algae as useless weeds is ra rather connected to a cultural imprint. Algae plagues like the one in Qingdao are pretty likely to occur more and more due to global warming. So we could say that algae are turning into the weeds of our future. There's a British author who has written a book about weeds, and in his book he points out something insightful, saying that weeds are nothing more than a plant in the wrong place. <laughs> so if we still regard algae as this unwanted plant, maybe we just didn't find the right place for it so far. As in me, we wondered what are the contemporary applications for this plant, and we heard about a lot of them, like biofuel, you can make nutrition out of it. We even have this algae-powered building here in Hamburg, right? Well, I must admit, I'm not an expert in any of those fields. I'm a designer, and we designers are usually universal dilettants. <laughs> but what we did is we turned to experts in order to find out what they're researching on. So we got in touch with the Fraunhofer Institute for Microalgae. And we tried to convince them to take a look at their laboratories, and we couldn't help realizing that they were quite irritated by our attempt to take a look at their work. But eventually, they let some strange artists take a look at their laboratories. And we found out a lot about their breeding technologies and how they're actually extracting the fats of the algae and so on. But, I mean, we did our best to understand what they're working in, but we are not biologists, so... In the end of the day, our heads were spinning from new impressions and new insights, and to be honest, we weren't quite sure what to do with all that information. But there was one thing that seemed striking to us. 
the scientists, they keep samples of their microalgae in a, something like a freezer, and it actually, it looks like this, so it's like a dried algae powder. <laughs> Doesn't look very interesting right now, I guess, <laughs> but there's one thing that was actually striking to us, and that was the colors of the algae. And that's something probably the scientists have never thought about, even though they have the material in their hands every single day. So, I mean, you can have different perspectives on the material. You can see it as this useless, unwanted material that you want to get rid of. You can have a futuristic vision, seeing its inherent potential for the future. But there seems to be one view that is actually missing, and that's the aesthetic view through the eyes of a designer. So when we asked the scientists if we could take some of the samples to our studio, they were like, yeah, I mean, sure, but what do you want to do with that green stuff? And yeah, sure, algae are green, but they have different shades of green. And besides that, they have this enormously nice ice blue that you can see there. They have different tones of yellow, brown, orange, and even a really bright red. So we made this shelf in the later state of the project to make people understand the natural intensity of this biological color palette. And people came up to us saying like, wow, these are some extremely nice colors, but um, where are the algae? <laughs> these are the algae. They're like, I don't know, single cells, really small. They're probably as small as the tip of a pin, and they live in water. So we started to work with it in the studio, actually as if you would work with any other material. And soon we figured out that our dried microalgae resemble a lot to pigments that you usually use for textile printing. So we started to print on biocotton, and soon we had our first microalgae color palette ready. But it was probably that point that we realized that we have quite a potential in our hands here. I guess not many of you are familiar with the textile industry but we all know that they're facing some severe issues with using chemicals and toxics in their dyeing process. This is China again, but don't be fooled. These are not algae. These are chemical pigments washed into the river. If you want to know what color is fashionable that season, take a look at the river. That's a popular saying of that area. Isn't that shocking? I mean, it's not only nature, it's the ones who are working with the material, but eventually, it's ourselves, as we are wearing colored textiles on our bodies every single day, right on our skin. And that's what makes you think, what if we had a natural pigment that doesn't harm nature or, or our own bodies? So we developed Algemi as a conceptual design project that uses microalgae as a pigment for textile printing. And the name itself already shows our working strategy. So it consists of two parts. You have algae on the one hand, this unwanted, unknown material. And on the other hand, you have alchemy, which is the most traditional form of researching upon an unknown material. So actually turning something worthless into something precious, eventually turning waste into gold. And this implies a lot of experimentation, and sometimes things can go wrong. <laughs> But I'm going to come back to that point later on. First of all, I would like to make you understand why we as designers are so fascinated about it. We could grow our own material just in the amount that we needed it. So we developed our own analog textile printer, and it's this machine. It's not as complicated as it looks. <laughs> um, it's a closed cycle of production. It actually goes from breeding the algae to printing with it, and it works in five steps. I'm going to explain it to you quickly. So it starts with the breeding, which means that you actually have a vessel where you plant a seed, and it grows. It grows like in any other vegetable garden, and it grows quite quick because it's algae. And then you will need to feed it eventually, which means that the algae, they're super modest as plants, so they need some sunlight, some water, and some additional CO2. And it's not what you think it is. We're exhaling into this vessel, so we're actually using our own breath to feed the algae. And once they are ready to harvest, we will filter them. And this is quite an interesting point, because we didn't invent it ourselves. It comes from Kenya, where at Lake Victoria, they're breeding algae as a cheap nutritional resource. And what they do is they actually filter the lake water through huge cotton cloths. And what they will have left behind is something like a dried cake that they will sell on the market later on. 
as food. And we basically do the same, only that our algae are not food, but we use them as pigments, so the starting point for our printing process. So we eventually produce a cooking, uh, we a printing paste, so we are cooking the material, and we will apply it to this printing row. And that's quite funny because we invented this technique ourselves. So it's quite rough. You have this machine and you can move it. So you can actually drive over the textiles and print while driving over it. So you can print, I don't know, up to 20 meters of textile in one go. And then you can also exchange the pattern mesh, which, which is this black rubber on top. So you can have different patterns. We developed our own textile collection for microalgae. But as I told you, we have an alchemistic working approach, which means that things sometimes don't work the way that you expect them to work. When we printed the first textiles and we put them up into the sun to let them dry, we came back after some time and we were actually shocked. Our entire color palette had changed. It changed from green to blue and from red to yellow. And we didn't quite know what to do with that. I mean, that's one of the basic reasons why the textile industry is using such a lot of chemicals. They want their colors to stay the same. It seems quite paradox to me, though. I mean, think, think about fashion. How long do we wear our t-shirts? I don't know, probably not longer than three years. So why should our colors stay the same for the next 30 years? So we thought, why shouldn't we take the dynamic quality of our color and turn it into something positive. After all, people change. So do textiles, aren't they? Imagine clothing or furniture that tells its own individual story of use, changing its color over time. We know this from other materials, like a nice wooden table that gains a patina, or the copper roof of churches turning green. We developed first conceptual clothing together with a fashion designer, Elenia Gortana from Berlin. Clothes that actually changed their color while they're worn. And I see this guy thinking for the entire talk already, wow, what are those crazy shoes that she's wearing? We also made first pr prototypes of microalgae printed shoes together with the German shoe label, Trippen. So, I mean, it was quite a long journey from a little bit of dried algae powder to those first prototypes, right? So you could ask yourself, what did we learn in those two years? Of course, we learned a lot about the material itself, but what seems even more important to me, as a designer, I learned to work with different fields of knowledge. Collaborating with a scientist actually opened up this entirely new perspective on the material, which probably we otherwise wouldn't have had. Think about TED. That's technology, a little bit of entertainment, and design. So when Richard Saul Woman, the founder of TED, brought the event into life in 1984, he probably did it out of the belief that innovation is not happening in the mind of one person only, not deriving from one single discipline. It happens when different people come together and different fields of knowledge are actually merging. So when people approach us today and ask us, what are you actually? Are you biologists, fashion designers, product designers? I mean, I must say, I take it as a compliment. It shows that true innovation is happening on this border of different disciplines. What does TED mean 30 years later? To me, it seems quite obvious that those times of great designers are almost over. Those dinosaurs of design who made a great car or a great chair, they certainly left their trace. But today, we require different structures of thinking. So we actually have the possibility to take a look on our own subject through the eyes of someone else, maybe even through the eyes of a dilettant. And this only, doesn't only work one way, so it's not only us who learn from the scientists, it's an ongoing iterative cycle of learning from each other. And I truly believe that this only happens when we design together. Alchemy can be seen as a first step towards this new collaborative path of production. It's certainly not a final idea or a finished solution. It's the first attempt to actually use this material, to use it for new applications. Think about algae. There are over 60,000 species of microalgae. And you, you know how many of them are used economically so far? It's 1%, 1% only. The rest is undiscovered land. And certainly not up to us alone to imagine new applications for this undiscovered resource. 
I can think about so many things like coloring, automotive seatings, or plastics, or nutrition, you name it. I don't know. I recently had a guy from a chocolate company walking up to me saying, he's planning on make, making a microalgae-based chocolate. So it's up to you and to all of us to imagine new applications for this undiscovered resource. Think in broader structures of production and processing in order to turn algae into more than the weeds of our future. More than just Unkraut. <laughs> Thank you.